on the Dutch beaches facing the North Sea is the one-time famous summer resort of Skaven England. Turned into a fortress by the Germans, the approaches were thoroughly mined against a light attack. Now the roads to the beach are cleared of teller mines by detachments of German engineers. The surrender terms stated that the Germans must remove all mines planted by them in their own or occupied territory. Jerry's squads and mine detectors are used to locate the hidden menaces. Casualties are sustained as the cleaning up process continues. The casualties are German, however, as ironic justice forces the master race to reap the havoc that they themselves have sown. On the shores of a picturesque lake in Germany is the Ratzeburg Recce Roost. A popular leave center for RCAF personnel, it is named by its discoverers, the 39 Recce Wing. Spotted from the air by one of the pilots, the Air Force standard soon flies over the Muskoka Lake's newest rival. The prominent Nazis who owned the place were soon evacuated by the town major and the burgomaster, and the Paradise Leave Center gets going in full swing. The rugged athletic types find plenty to keep their muscles bulging, while the less energetic just sit and contemplate the beautiful scenery. There'll be many tall tales of the one that got away told around the mess table tonight. With the tough jobs over Germany well and thoroughly completed, the Skymen relax as they await the next move. A good substitute for Banff, the Laurentians, or Lake of Bays is provided by the summer home in the heart of Naziland, the Ratzeburg Recce Roost. Royal Canadian engineers discover a peaceful use for mine detectors. At Groningen, in Holland, a work party goes treasure hunting as they seek buried wealth in the muck and mire of the low country. Mr. and Mrs. Van Brako buried precious gems in their backyard during the German occupation. Now the mine detectors search through the flooded morass to locate a little cold cream jar in which is packed the hidden jewelry. Finally, it is discovered, much to the delight of the Dutch couple. Sent to them by Jewish refugees who fled the fury of the invader, the Van Brackels braved imprisonment to secrete the treasure. During the years of German occupation and the ensuing floods, the exact location of the cache was forgotten. So Canadian engineers were called in. Valued at $25,000, the gems will be turned into cash to rebuild a war-torn home. Hollanders arrive at a Canadian cemetery in Bergen, Holland, to take part in its dedication. Graves are visited of airmen who were shot down and secretly buried by Dutch civilians during the past four years. Units of the 1st Canadian Agra parade to the special memorial service, which is conducted by Padre Honorary Captain William Hall of London, Ontario. For many of the fighting men who lie beneath the crosses, the ceremony marks the first burial service to be conducted over their remains. Due to the secrecy of the burial plot, it was not possible to observe the last rites before. The Germans finally discovered the plot, but allowed crosses to be erected. Now the fallen heroes receive tribute from Canadian countrymen. From all over the wide world, dispatches arrived to swell the news baskets of Canada's youngest newspaper, the Maple Leaf Mark III. The first Maple Leaf, of, by, and for the Canadian Active Army, saw the light of day in Italy shortly after the invasion. When D-Day rolled around and Khan was overrun, the Maple Leaf Mark II commenced publication in the battered town. And now the London edition goes to press. It is different to its brother sheets inasmuch as it is printed as a daily paper for the three services. All editorial work is done by men of the forces. Their copy is passed to the civilian staff of the Evening Standard for publishing. 
News stories of interest to all Canadian servicemen and women are lined up ready for the presses. assistant editor look over the proof of the latest edition. After they have given their approval to the makeup, the mighty presses commence to roll. Approximately 45,000 copies are struck off daily. The circulation department used every available system of distribution, both military and civilian, to ensure that a copy of the sheet reaches every Canadian service person in the United Kingdom. Thus, the Canadian point of view is brought to Johnny Canuck with his spam and coffee every day, thanks to the hard-working staff of the Maple Leaf Mark III. The good ship Hospitality Jane, flagship of the KFC Navy, is off on a delightful cruise on the River Seine. With Paris the focal point for hundreds of Canadian service people on leave, the auxiliary services go all out to show them a good time. With pretty hostesses and good food provided to while away the time, and the fare only 50 francs, the trip gets a great play from the service sightseers. Historic spots like the Eiffel Tower, previously only seen on a postcard, are viewed at first hand as the boat glides upstream. The glorious pile that is Notre Dame recalls other great cathedrals blasted by relentless war. The hospitality Jane on her maiden voyage under her new owners provides another link in the chain of hospitality offered to Canadians on leave by their friends of the auxiliary services. With the Allied air target switched to Japan, Canadian industry speeds up production of super fortresses for the final knockout of the Nipponese. At the Boeing aircraft plant in Vancouver, girl workers go all out on the assembly line to the bomb bay section of the giant kite fuselage. As the men put the plating into position, a champion girl riveter drives another spike into the coffin of the Japanese warlord. In the great PC factory, a Bombay pressure tunnel nears completion, and two Chinese riveters delight in the task of building for their enemy's destruction. The pressure tunnel is used for the passage of the air crew from the front to the tail of the giant plane. High pressure production turns out the completed Bombay in an incredibly short time. It is ready to be shipped to Seattle for assembly in the completed plane. At a Canadian airfield, the workers are given a chance of viewing with pride the completed article into which they have put so many hours of sweat and toil. Planes for the United States Army Air Corps, partially built by Canadian workers, is just another example of United Nations teamwork. riveting hammers of Canadian workers, augmenting the guns of Allied airmen, the great symphony of victory swells to a crescendo. Soon the hail of death from mighty planes will, in fiery phrases, right the knee to the history of the last aggressor, the empire that was Japan. Japan.